which takes care of Carvley and Farsley, Farnley and Wortley and Pudsey. Uh, today we're going to be live streamed on YouTube, so I hope there's lots of people watching. Welcome to you all who are watching. I'll uh, start to introduce officers and members, starting from my left, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Stevenson, Localities Officer for the Outer West Community Committee. Good afternoon, Councillor Anne Forsyth, Farnley and Wortley Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Anne Blackburn, Farnley and Wortley Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Peter Carlyle, Cavalier and Farsley Ward. Good afternoon, Paul Bingham. I'm team leader in policy and plans in planning and sustainable development. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Ampliff, um, and I'm here as, as manager of the street naming numbering service. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Lobsker. I'm the leads and, so leads and social behaviour team supervisor in the West. Afternoon, I'm Jane Patterson, Programme Managing Safer Stronger Communities Team. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Emma Slater, Project Manager in Sustainable Energy and Air Quality. Good afternoon, Ruth Turner, Team Manager in Environmental Health. Good afternoon, I'm Jeremy Lund, and I'm here representing Highways and Transportation. Good afternoon, I'm Councillor Trish Smith. I represent the Pudgy Ward. Good afternoon, Don Seary, Councillor for Pudsey Swin on Tyersall Ward. Councillor Simon Seary, Pudsey Ward. Councillor Andrew Carter, Carvey and Farsley Ward. Debbie Oldham, and I'm the clerk to the committee. Uh, Councillor David Blackburn, finally, and Wortley, and Vice Chair. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll now move on to the agenda. So I'm going to hand over to Debbie Eldham, the clerk, to take us through the first few items. Thank you, Chair. So under agenda item one, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Under agenda item two, there are no items which require the exclusion of the press or the public. Agenda item three, there are no late items of business. Agenda item four, could I ask members to declare any interests? I'll take silence as there are none. Under agenda item five, there are no apologies. Under agenda item six, um, we do have a gentleman here who wishes to speak. Um, is that permissible, Chair? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Brian, it's your turn to speak. Mr. Brian Woolley is going to speak on the Sunnybank postcodes. Uh, my name is Brian Woolley here to represent the residents of the Sunnybank estate who have a, applied to change the postcode from a, a BD3 to an LS28. Uh, I have lived on the Sunnybanks for 55 years and have experienced personally mix-ups by departments to do with health and other issues uh, and also where of the same uh, affecting other residents. And this has gone on for a lot of years. I'm quite aware of the Royal Mail stock answer about postcode delivery system and misuse of it by other agencies, i.e. refusal to insure vehicles. That does happen just because it's a BD3 postcode. Uh, and the same applies in some cases to houses. Uh, trade deliveries, uh, inaccurate A to Z street locations. There is a, a Leeds street location and the Sunnybanks, Avenue, Grove and Lane have all got different postcode numbers. Uh, in other parts of Leeds. Instead of being uh, anywhere where we are, uh, the one is Leeds 8, another Leeds 10, and another one Leeds 12. 
and that's just the sunny banks. Um, a few years ago, the Leeds Council moved the Leeds boundary from a uh, sign from Gain Lane and put it on the outside of a factory, but it put the Sunnybank estate on the Bradford side of the boundary sign. And it was only after um, complaints that the uh, boundary sign was recited at the present location it's on now, which is correct. The distance between the Royal Mail boundary and Leeds City boundary is less than 100 metres. <clears throat> and the Sunnybank Estate is sandwiched in that gap. There are 63 dwellings on the estate and over the weekend, I asked 107 of the residents if they wanted the an LS28 postcode. Everybody said yes. And that was 100% of the people that I met throughout the estate. <coughs> uh, well. Sensible logic to me personally is the Royal Mail lose nothing by a change of postcode, but the residents who are Leeds Council taxpayers gain more efficient services and recognition. And that to me is a win win situation. The, the Royal Mail lose absolutely nothing. Uh, we residents would appreciate your support to achieve this LS28 postcode and be recognised properly as lead citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woolley, for highlighting the problems and difficulties that you are experiencing on the Sunny Banks through having a Bradford postcode and living in Leeds. As you know, it's going to be discussed a little later on in the agenda. Thank you very much. Can we move on to um, the next item, which is the minutes? Have you all read the minutes and can we agree them? Yes, matters are right. Yeah, matters are rising, Anya. Yeah. Oh, it's on now. Um, yes, it was just to ask on page nine about if you'd heard any more from Dazzle. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I highlighted to Ian Rodley at Dazzle the request to add more um, sessions in using the surplus money. I haven't heard back from them as of yet. I know they were looking to see if they could plan it in but after their initial ones that they've already got scheduled fulfilled um i will i will chase them up later on today and get back to you this week any more questions okay moving on to the next so uh mike the update please thank you chair uh good afternoon councillors officers and members of the public um our first report today is the Outer West Finance Report, which can be found on page 13 of the reports pack. Um, this provides the committee with an update on the budget positions for each of the funding pots for 2021-2022, along with an update on the COVID-19 remaining budgets also. And within the report, there are also four funding applications for decision today at the committee. Three of these are from the large grant fund and one from the YAF allocation, which we'll go through in due course. Um, so beginning with the budget, referring to paragraph 16 on page 15, this asks the committee to note that since the previous committee meeting in September, there's been one project that was passed by DDN. Uh, this was the Farsley Cenotaph restoration work coming from Carveley and Farsley Capital to the amount of £10,000. Uh, then on paragraph 17, which is also on page 15, this asks the committee to note that since the last committee meeting, there are two projects that have informed us of the need to cancel their project for this year. The first is Farsley Festival, which was from the YAF budget. 
the festival committee have advised me that they've decided not to run the festival this year and will be preparing a new bid for a larger event next financial year instead. And the second project is the Breeze Friday Night Project, which again was coming from YAF. Um, Laura Hobman, the officer there, has advised that due to the current team limitations and workload, they're not able to run the Friday Night Project this year, along with the three across the city. Um, the recent restructure has left them lacking in capacity to support this, but they are looking to reassess for next year. And that was the amount of £10,154. If there are no objections from the committee, these projects will be closed down by the community's team and the funding returned to the AFPOT as available funds. If I could just uh, comment on, on page 15 in general. Uh, members of the committee will be pleased to know the fastest and tough scheme has begun um, with the repainting of the railings having been completed before uh, Remembrance Sunday. Um, the rest of the scheme will not be done until January, we hope, because we didn't want to have the whole place turned upside down when it was going to be Remembrance Sunday. When, uh, and on the Farsley Festival, <coughs> the um, I've had to two contacts from the Farsley Festival scheme, and they are hoping to combine the Farsley Festival with the uh, Platinum Jubilee of the Queen um, next year, and it will be a, a bigger event. So I, I think we need to keep that in mind. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the next section provides a summarised account of the current budget positions for each funding pot. Uh, so paragraph 18 to 21, starting on page 15, asks the committee to note that the total available wellbeing budget for Outer West for this financial year is £139,614.28. Um, and the committee is asked to note that today it has allocated £92,421.62 to projects ring fences which leaves a remaining balance of £48,277.20. Uh, table 1 on page 16 provides a breakdown of this allocation also for awareness. Uh, and this brings us on to the three large grant project applications for decision at this point in the report. The details can be found on paragraph 24, which is page 17 of the report. Um, the first project is Summer Bands in Leeds Parks 2022, um, organised by Leeds International Concert Season. The requested amount from wellbeing is £3,250, covering all three wards in Outer West. Uh, start date would be May 2022. Um, and the funding is requested for following con the following concerts in Outer West, two in Farnley Hall Park, three in Pudsey Park, two in Victoria Park, two in Western Flats Cliff Park, and one in West Roy Park. Uh, these concerts benefit the community in Outer West, um, allowing people to experience free music in the local parks, as well as coming from other areas of Leeds. Um, this meets the community committee priorities of best city for communities and best city for health and wellbeing. Questions, queries? <laughs> uh, it says one in Westroyd Park. In point of fact, there's usually been a second one which has been paid for out of the money given to the Farsley Festival. They've, they've had a band concert there for, I think, all three years it's been running, but that's come out of their grant. Any more questions and queries, or are we all happy with that? David? Councillor Yes, um, so I followed up with Mike regarding some extra costs on that, and we got confirmation that the PUTS is going to get four more funded through the, um, I can't remember, where, arts planning team on top of them, so that's quite good, thank you. Can we all agree that one then? Okay, move on to the next item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, second application is from the West Yorkshire Police. Uh, titled Outer West Antisocial Behaviour and Speeding Resources, uh, requesting from well-being £5,920, covering all wards, 
uh, start would be November 2021, so immediate start working through to March 2022. Um, just a brief description, a data analysis from police systems has highlighted issues in Outer West over the last 12 months compared to the previous year. ASB has increased 9% to nearly 1,500 calls for services from the community in the three wards. Um, and secondly, the report includes 473 reports of nuisance cars, bands, and quad bikes. Inspector Gill's team would like to work with colleagues from the road policing unit to address the increased issue of speeding, dangerous driving, antisocial driving, and antisocial behavior included by young people. Um, they will deploy a specialist traffic officer and an NPT officer in a traffic car where intelligence indicates speeding and dangerous driving. And where there are clusters of antisocial behavior, this will be served with either a PCSO or a PCSO and an NPT officer. The costings allow for 160 hours of specialist road traffic officer slash police constable time and 80 hours of PCSO officers for the ward area. And the overtime deployments would run immediately and finish next March. Mr. Blackburn. Um, uh, while I fully support this, um, there's no indication of how local members can feed into this. And I think it's important that we do feed into this because we get to know things probably before police do. Uh, and we all know where we have areas where we have problems with, with speeding. Um, so can we have some indication through to them? As a, I'm not, don't hold it up, get on with it. But the fact is that we need we need some feedback how we can uh, how we can involve ourselves. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Blackburn. I, I I agree with that. I think we've all suffered, particularly since lockdown, from speeding in particular, and it's horrendous, particularly on the six four seven, where they are racing through the night. It's absolutely appalling that residents should have to put up with this. So I think it's an excellent scheme. So can we all agree that? Yeah, Councillor Siri. So yeah, I've been speaking with. Um... The inspector to work this project up for some time now. I think it was February we first had the conversation. So you'll get initial, you'll get a breakdown of every single overtime that they've done and what the outcome would be for them areas as well. So it's really targeted, and then there will liaise with with members to to make sure that we're targeting the right areas. So it is, it's not just a blanket; it's where we want them to to work. Good, excellent. So can we agree that? Yep. Thank you. Next one, Mike, please. Thank you, Chair. The third large grant apl application is also from the West Yorkshire Police and the project title is Cycle Security. Uh, this is requesting £1,460, again, covering all three wards, uh, starting immediately, ending in September 2022. And for note, this is a, a joint application with the Inner West Community Committee who are being requested the same amount. So the total cost is £2,920. Um, Quick description, in the past 12 months, we've had 148 reported pedal cycle thefts across the ward area. Um, our force crime prevention officer advises the research suggests that three times as many are stolen and not reported. Uh, PCSO Michael Broxup is based at Pudsey Police Station and is a bike champion, uh, meaning he's got additional training and information about bike security. And he would like to do a series of events across the three wards to give residents advice on bike safety and security. The funding is requested for a, a thousand selector mark products to be fitted to cycles at these events and their codes registered on the national cycle database which means if a, if a cycle is stolen it can immediately be identified with an owner and officers can also scan a bike on the spot and determine who owns it um, they believe that marking will make bikes less desirable for thieves and um, marking them will drastically reduce offenses of theft uh, community committee priorities are the best city for communities and best city for health and well-being. Thank you, Mike. Any comments, questions? Cas Carlo. Yeah, I think it looks like a good one because it's it's obviously taking police time up to find where these bikes should go, and and, and if it does uh, deter people from stealing them in the first place, that that would be good. There's um, been a couple of events funded out of Leeds, in fact, in the Rodley area along the canal, which is popular for commuters, and I think they were oversubscribed actually. So there is a need in the area. So yeah, I'd I'd support it. Blackburn, and then Councillor Carter. Uh, again. Um... Can we make can we 
send a message that we want board member involvement uh, where the, where you know where they're going to and what have you. I think all of us are used to the days when <clears throat> you could perhaps leave your bicycle in the back garden and those days are long gone and uh, there's more and more people wandering about now but uh, you wouldn't you have to question what they're up to uh, <clears throat> there's no doubt that people's property has been invaded over and over again and if bicycles are left uh, unguarded unmarked then i'm afraid to say somebody's going to nick them uh, so yes absolutely support this is everybody happy to support this Yep, agreed. Thank you. So moving on to the next one, Mike, which is youth activities. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so youth activities fund, if I can bring you to page 19, paragraphs 27 to 29, this asks the committee to note the total available for spend by the Outer West Committee in this financial year is £69,371 and two pence. So far, the committee has approved £47,010 to ring fences and projects, which leaves a remaining balance of £23,460.30. And, uh, and again, we've got table two on page 19 showing a breakdown of this allocation. Um, and just to note regarding the total, the two cancelled projects, uh, which the committee was made aware of, will be returned to the pot which meaning a new total would be £37,964.30. Um, and this brings us on to the final application for decision today from the YAF fund, the details of which can be found on page 20 in paragraph 31. Sorry, the project title is Beats on the Street. The name of the organisation is The Music Box, Funding requested is £4,950. Um, this would cover Pudsey Ward with a start date of the 26th of November through to December 2022. Um, just a quick overview, the project addresses a gap in provision for young people living in Pudsey who are involved in or at risk of antisocial behaviour. Um, in partnership with the Leeds West Youth Service, the project will deliver a pilot urban music and arts-based programme for young people. This would run every Friday night, starting from the 26th for three weeks and then for 10 weeks every term until the end of next year. Uh, there would be 33 sessions in total, targeting a maximum of 12 young people per week to take part in the project, with activities including DJing and beat making, rapping, beatboxing and lyric writing and graffiti and visual arts. And this meets the committee priorities of best city for young people and children and best city for communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Questions? Uh, Councillor Blackburn, Councillor Carter, Councillor Seary, Councillor Anne Blackburn. I'm going to need to work. Um, but um, regarding project, uh, I, I've, I've no, I, I mean, I know there's been some discussion about it, but I take no view on that. The only thing I would say is, is that this year we've got was it 60 how much 60 69,000 didn't take yeah 69,000 pounds and that's due to underspends last year uh, the annual amount we get is 43,000 pounds and it, let's put it this way hopefully we'll get that next year but we might not we might get less if you look at what we've put out already and you include the two uh, council projects. Uh, for instance, we know, or we suppose, the Fardley Festival will, will, will take place in 2022, uh, and we'll expect that to come up. And that will take the, and, and, and if you assume the projects that are done in Fardley and Carvely uh, are done next year, that would take that back up to 11,699. Uh, just about two and a half thousand less than what a third of the money we get is. If the breeze Friday night, if, if you take on this extra project in, in Pulsey, which as I say, I'm not got no problem with, that is supposed to be a pilot. So one assumes that we're going to do it again, if it works. And the Friday night breeze project comes up. We could find ourselves 
we're in a position where we've got projects up to £26,000 coming to us in February when we've got when we're budget. And as I said, um, and if you take it in my ward, if we do exactly the same as we do, we're doing this year, we're about £1,000 short of what a third of uh, uh, YAF fund is. Uh, so I, I, what I say is we need to be careful. I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but what we've got to remember is, is um, well, I suppose you could say we're lucky or unlucky to have this extra money this year because because of cancellations we get like ne last year, but we ain't going to get it next year. And um, basically, we've got to be very careful where we're spending this money. That's all. Councillor Andre Carter. Um, Mike, have these this organisation in another guy's been to us before and been turned down? Thanks, Councillor. Yes, so the Music Box applied for some funding in the summer for a, a project that would run across three wards. I believe it was for a total of 12, 13,000 pounds. It was quite a large sum of money, uh, but it was covering three wards and that was declined earlier in the year. Um, I believe on the basis that it was quite spread out and also the committee advised that it wasn't quite targeting the individuals that you would hope it would um, at, at this time, considering some of the antisocial issues in the area. And that was what was fed back to the music box. Um, also with a view for them to readdress what they were offering and come back to the committee if they, if they wanted to and put another proposition forward. I'm a bit concerned, I have to say. I mean, if, if money was unlimited, I'd say, well, let's give it a try. It's not unlimited. <clears throat> David made a very good point about us overspending. I think that we need to be absolutely uh, aware of that. Uh, and I'm not at all happy. It, um, I, I would want to see certainly that the part of Pudsey in our ward was was catered for and the young people there and, and not just one ward when we come to this stage of the year we're talking about pushing five thousand pounds thank you councillor theory oh sorry so i appreciate the, the the comeback um and just concentrate on one ward i think the issue was they didn't know our areas and and that's where the issue between the councillors came you know they were suggesting family cricket club which you know want the right area for you what you were saying i think because we've lost the friday night project i think we, we need to do something in the center of Pudsey on a friday and i think hopefully this will will fill that gap um and then we'll just you know we'll we'll keep monitoring it um and ask for more information from them as the project goes through i think i would like to support that Councillor Ann Blackburn. Yes, Chair, well, I have concerns as well because it's nearly £5,000. I do remember them coming last time and it did seem as if they didn't seem to know all three areas that well. As Councillor Siri said, uh, they, certainly our, our area um, where they suggested wasn't the right place, you know, but we, we could have sort of um, directed them to a better place, I'm sure. I just got the impression last time that they weren't really able to cover all three wards anyway. Um, so they went back to Pudsey, but £5,000 just for one ward there. And bearing in mind, as has been said, we don't know what monies we're going to be getting next year it, it does concern me so i can't say i'm in favor of it thank you also for safe um so this is directly related really to what we're talking about um do you have any idea mike how they will um find and invite the particular individuals to take part in this because i think that's quite crucial to make sure it's actually going to be direct directed at the ones that it's aimed to be directed at um, so the information they provided is that they would work closely with the Leeds Youth Service um, and 
cooperate with the um, Andes Youth Project, which would be running in the area to try and identify the right people that could take part on a weekly basis. They have advised that the attendance can vary each week, though they would anticipate that it would be a similar attendance that are coming to them each week um, during the term time. But yeah, it's, it's through the Leeds Youth Service that they would be hoping to identify the individuals that could most benefit from the, uh, from the project. Mr. Carlisle. I think looking at it, I hadn't actually got Simon's point there that actually it's for 13 months that this is covering, which is a sizable amount of time. So if they are coming back to us next year, then it's at least going to be, well, it's at least going to be January 23 before they come back again, if this is the pilot. And then I think we'd want to review it. So it's probably that there's no extra spend going to be next year. It'd be the following year that would be seen whether the pilot worked. If this does have a success and they're working with the youth service to try and target those people, then I think it's probably value for money in some of the issues that have been faced around the Pudsey area. So I'm, I'm reasonably happy to support it if there's very strict monitoring involved. We know which young people are in there and, and we can have conversations with agencies such as the police and the youth service to ensure that it is targeting groups that, that we think would have caused um, difficulties around the area. If, if it's helping to alleviate some of that problem, then I'd say it's probably value for money, but I think it does have to be tightly um, controlled and monitored to make sure that that comes up. You have raised a point, Councillor Carlisle, that uh, I raised at the last time that they this organisation put in an application. And I quite clearly said that I had met with the Chief Superintendent of Leeds and his team with regard to how you distract young people from knife crime and other serious crimes. And they said sport, which is quite a lot of provision for and music, which there isn't a lot of provision for. And I know this because I've worked in a previous life with a lot of music organisations. He also said that the type of kid that is committing this kind of crime would not engage with youth services or the police because they see those as the establishment and they wouldn't engage with that. We well, quite clearly said that to them. And yet they've come back with an application which says they're going to work with the youth services. Now, if it's if it's for a different group of kids, well, so be it. But I think we do have a particular problem in Pudsey. We've had three knifings there, and I think there's been another another incident since then. Um, and we, we really do need to try and attract that. My idea would be to go to the violence reduction team and say to them, which music organisations are you using and how, how do we get them to apply? Because I do think something needs to be done. And I think music is really important to some kids. And going by my previous experiences that children who are verging on serious crime want to do something that is very cool. And it's not for everybody, and it's, it's a specialised area. And I think the Violence Reduction Unit might have a better take on this. So I, I personally don't think we should support it, but I think I'm going to have to put it to the vote because clearly there is a divide. Councillor Carter, did you want to say something? Uh Councillor Kyle made it's over 13 months, which gives us an ample opportunity, let's say, in the balance of this financial year, to monitor if they were prepared to undertake it for half the period of time they're asking for, for us to monitor it. And if it's working, renew it. And if it's not, scrap it. Councillor David Blackburn. Uh, then I think it would uh, allow us to see if the Friday night project is going to be uh, redone. Uh, because as I say, I mean that's that's my my main concern is is that we don't find ourselves in February with with uh, too many things chasing too little mo too little money. Uh, and my my own thing when we set stuff up um, for young people, and I've seen this happen quite often, is you'll set something up. And then second year, you don't get money. And what you're doing, you're letting them down. And I'd rather not start somewhere than that I, I don't think we can carry through. Uh, but I think that's a good idea. Oh, Councillor Carson. So have we got a proposal and a seconder?
and review it. Sorry, I'm doing the same thing now, not turning my mic on. Is, is everybody happy with that? Okay, right, fine. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chair. I'll take that to them. Um, okay, so moving on, the next section is the small grants and skips, uh, which is table three on page 22, which provides the committee with a breakdown of the small grants and skips budget. Um, so far, the committee has approved seven skips and eight small grant projects leaving a current remaining total of £189.55. And then moving on, we've got the capital budget. This is table five on page 23. And then following a recent injection, the committee is asked to note a new total for ward balances. Um, we can see in the table, Carvely and Farsley have £4,555.36. Finally, and Wortley with £8,291.26, Pudsey with £10,392.38, um, an area total of £23,239. And then in similar fashion, the SIL budget, which is table five on page 24, Carvel and Farsley with £8,512.61, Finally, and Wortley with £19,194.08, Pudsey with £58,285.05, and five pence, um, an area total of £85,991.74. How's the Carter then, Councillor Seary? Um, on our sil on Carvin and Farsley sill money, I recall that we agreed to put a SID and some fixings for SIDs so we can move them around on the Springbank estate in Farsley and there is no sign of anything. And I think this was months and months and months ago. Can we find out what's happened, please? Thanks, Councillor Carter. Yeah, I'll chase that up with highways and see where they're at Thank with you. it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just about the, you know, the skip budget. Um, we seem to, obviously, there's a charge there, £152 for a skip, but we seem to always go overweight on these skips and it comes back a lot more, you know, nearly double the price. And this, they're sending a big skip out, so they're expecting the groups to fill it. Would it be recommended that we send them a smaller skip so they can't overfill it and then they're not charged the extra excess? Sorry. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the, the standard skip that we approve is the eight yard skip, which is the smallest one that we can offer. And, and that's been agreed to try and limit that happening in terms of an overweight charge. Um, but I appreciate what you're saying. We have had a few instances where they've come back. Um, the tonnage has been over the one ton threshold that we pay for. Um, and I know it's being looked into by the team to try and improve some of our processes around skips to see how we can avoid that. Because I guess the issue is how do you know once you've gone over a ton? Um, it's something we're aware of, um, and I'll keep you updated if we if we can find a resolution to that to stop it happening in the future. Councillor Blackburn. Uh, yes, this is just to do with our sill budget, and uh, we'd like to have uh, two more SIDs installed. I've spoke to Mike about that, and he suggested that to get it moving. That uh, I mentioned it today obviously with the approval of my two colleagues and so if we could do that we, we want one at the bottom of Winkover Drive and uh, so, sorry Butterball, Butterball yeah. Drive and uh, um, one at the bottom of Low Wortley Road near Branch Road and we want that out of the sill place our sill Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Um, yeah, I, I confirmed the cost was 3,500 per unit, so that would be 7,000 coming off finally in Wortley's total. Um, if, yeah, if the ward councillors are happy, I'll, yeah. I'll take that forward with highways and um, liaise with yourself about the specific locations when they come to install. That's right, yes. Yeah. As, lo as long as you, you put it on right road. She can, the second time of day she's caught, say wrong road.
Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, I believe we were up to just a quick update on the COVID funds as well, uh, table six. Um, just that Carvley and Farsley Ward have got £3,125 remaining. Farnley and Wortley with £2,500 remaining and Putty um, with nothing remaining. They're all spent up. So a total of £5,625. Out of the council, Mark Byrne. Um, this has to be spent by March 31st, yeah? Um, ideally, yes, because it's been carried forward from can, last year. Can I ask you if you'd, if you'd contact um, the Rotary Club about the Christmas meals for isolated elderly people this year? I can't see they can have raised many funds towards the provision. So um, I think they may well need some money to help them through. They did the biggest distribution, I think, done for many years last Christmas, and I suspect it'll be the same again this year. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Would you like me just to um, speak to them about yeah. how much yeah, would potentially yeah, help yeah, them? Yeah, I would, yeah. Um, just on, on our COVID 2,500 that we have, uh, we are discussing, well, Councillor Phil Safe's leading on it, we're discussing uh, um, possible way of spending it, if we can spend it that way, but uh, we've got a little bit of spade work is still to do, so so we'll, we'll be in contact. Thank you, Councillor Babburn, that's fine. Just, just let me know when you, you want to proceed. Um, thank you, Chair, that's the end of the finance report. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Good. Right on to the next item, which is item nine. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the item nine is the update report for the area um, and brings to the members' attention a summary of work from a variety of services and departments affecting the, war, uh, the three ward areas. Um, and provides an opportunity to request a more detailed report on particular issues. Included in the report for this meeting, we've got contributions from cleaner neighbourhoods, gully cleansing, public health, the housing team, the housing advisory panel, CCTV, the Outer West Community Hubs, Leeds Libraries, Community Centres and the Community Engagement Social Media Report. In keeping with previous approaches and due to the length of the document, the committee has agreed to take the update report as read um, with just a few highlights, which I'll very quickly mention now. The first thing I wanted to highlight was a contribution from Public Health, which is paragraph 31 on page 32. Um, and this is just regarding a COVID-19 vaccine pop-up centre that's been planned for Farnley and Wortley for two dates. Um, when the report was published, those dates hadn't been finalized um, one has passed it was last friday um, but the second date is friday the 19th of november at the old family and district community association and um, it's open from 11 a.m to 2 p.m for anyone over the age of 16 eligible for their first or second jabs um, so this has been advertised on the committee's facebook page and also on the covid19 support pages but any any help sharing the information is appreciated i know public health have distributed uh, printed posters um, but I can also provide digital flyers or anything digitally that needs to be shared. Um, secondly, just referring to paragraph 24, which is on page 42, um, I've included a new contributor in the update report for this edition, which is a section on the community centres in the area. And in this report, we've had a contribution from Yvonne Allman at Swinnow Community Centre, um, who's highlighted the success of a recent weekend at the Seaside event, which ran for a week in early September. Um, it was attended by over 220 people on a daily basis and had a wide variety of children's activities. And the intention here is just to provide an opportunity for community centres in the area to showcase some of their work um, that they've done and just help publicise their offering and influence in the local community. So that's something that I'll be continuing. And then thirdly and finally, just a very, um, a very brief update to mention to Farnley and Wortley Ward. Um, you now have a new housing manager, which I believe you're aware of, um, Andrew Sheeda, following the departure of Joanne Taylor to another office. So this contribution comes from Andrew and is his first in taking over the area. Um, Sophie Roberts continues to be the point of contact for Pudsey and for Carvley and Farsley. 
Um, thank you, Chair. If there's no questions, that's the end of the update report. Well, I just have one comment. <clears throat> I'm going to stop uh, commending officers when they're doing a good job because as soon as we do that, you move them. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna Taylor has done an excellent job in our uh, in our area. Really pleased with all the hard work she's done. Um, perhaps you could just pass on uh, our thanks and uh, tell us to come back soon. Any other comments and queries? We, Councillor Carter. Fourteen um, percent of the gullies in our ward uh, were either not inspected or uh, were found not to be running. Um, and uh, I have asked on two or three occasions now for one particular area. Uh, and actually, it's BD3. Uh, if, they, if we would, could remember that it is part of Leeds and go up and clean the gullies. Yes, yes here, here, Councillor Carter. <laughs> Any more questions or queries? Can we note the contents? Thank you. Now we're on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Sunnybank BD postcode request report. And um, earlier in, in the meeting, we heard Mr. Brian Woolley, one of the local residents, speaking to that item. So, can I hand over to who is who's the officer? In? Can I over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Paul Bingham. I'm the team leader in planning and sustainable development for the team that um, includes the street naming and numbering function. Um, the report, um, the Sunnybank BD BD3 postcode request reports at uh, page 51 of the report pack, and that includes an appendix uh, with the main report prepared by planning and sustainable development at page 55. Um, the report's being presented, being presented seeks to investigate options for moving forward long, long standing issues for residents who have a BD, Bradford Postcode, and are within Leeds City Council. Uh, and just to be clear on this report, um, it's been brought to the committee to note and um, for discussion and questions. Um, um, the final decision with regard to postcode changes is made by the Royal Mail uh, and not City Council, so we're not asking members to make a decision on the postcode itself. I'll just hand over now to Rachel Ancliffe, who's the principal street naming and numbering officer who manages the street naming and numbering function to just go through the details of, of the main report in the appendix. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so officers in planning and sustainable development were contacted separately um, by the Sunnybank Recreation Group and also Stuart Andrew MP. Um, to request our assistance. Um, Stuart Andrew MP has, has had a number of previous engagements with Royal Mail to discuss issues that his constituents experience who lives particularly in BD3, BD4 and BD10 areas of the Bradford postal town, as determined by Royal Mail, but are, are within Leeds City Council. Officers within the council agreed to undertake a smaller consultation of residents in the three streets covered by the Sunnybank Recreation Group as a test exercise to further understand the nature and cause of issues being experienced. And this is covered in sections one and two of the final report. The consultation took place between September and December 2020 and combined with historical feedback from previous consultations undertaken by Stuart Andrew MP, uh, it was able to demonstrate the residents experience confusion and issues with health referrals being made to the wrong health area or local authority or being incorrectly rejected by the correct area. Also, there was confusion over which hospital a patient should be taken to. There were issues with midwifery services, um, confusion with COVID restrictions, and, and a perception of, of higher insurance costs uh, and lower house prices. Uh, this is covered by sections three and four of the final report. Um, the final report includes responses from a number of organizations cited by residents. Um, this includes Royal Mail, which is covered in Appendix 7, uh, the Emergency Services, which is covered in appendix, Appendices 1, 3 and 4, and the NHS CCG, which is covered in Appendices 5 and 6. The report concludes that whilst changing the postcode may resolve some of the reported issues, it would not resolve all of the issues. Uh, some referral systems are not based on the resident's home postcode, 
and some referral systems are not being applied correctly by those services. It is acknowledged that those with BD3 postcodes may be impacted more than other areas. In light of Raw Mail's response confirming that they would not change the postcode for what they consider to be non-operational reasons, um, the report recommends further engagement with health services to raise awareness of the reported issues and to seek improvements to current systems and processes. Um, this conclusion does not prejudice any further action that residents or other parties um, may wish to take independently to continue engagement with raw mail. Um, this is covered in sections five and six of the final report. Um, finally, um, since um, the covering report was made available as part of this agenda, we've been asked to correct uh, the name that is in that report from Sunnybank Residents Group to Sunnybank Recreation Group. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Andre Carter? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think at the beginning of what I'm going to say, I should I make it very clear that um, the Member of Parliament uh, had hoped this would be, if you like, and I agree with him, um, the stepping stone to move all these BD postcodes out of the way and get Leeds postcodes. And, and it was right to start with Sunny Bank because the residents there had done so much work of their own and continue to do so to, to prove the case. And, and um, whilst I have to say I'm extremely thankful to uh, Rachel Ancliffe and, and other officers for the work they've done, and I know the residents are as well, <coughs> I just feel as though to some degree we're moving around in circles and, and that's most unfortunate. I'm gonna give you another instance of um, something which I've only just discovered. And I need to pick my words carefully because it's a, um, a semi-private matter. But um, recently at a, at a hearing, I'll put it no stronger than that, um, a, a local resident was challenged as to how he could possibly live in Leeds with a postcode of BD3. Uh, when his dustbins must be collected by the city of Bradford, which the person questioning was told, I'm sorry, the dustbins are collected by the city of Leeds. I live in Leeds, I pay my council tax to Leeds, and the services I receive come from Leeds. And there are all sorts of connotations to this particular thing, which I'm not going to go into, uh, not here anyway. Um, because there you have a classic example of somebody in some authority actually believing the dustbins in all the BD areas, because went on to say that um, only in Driglington were the dustbins collected by Leeds, and they have a postcode that was different. Completely untrue. And after all these years, people in authority still don't recognise so we had all hoped that this would be the beginning of everybody else who also suffers uh, service confusion of an alarming rate, um, finally getting relief from it, starting with BD3, because those are the people who've done the most work in, the, in their own commu small community to get the argument across. And it just seems to me that here, I asked for this to go before the exec board of the council, which they have refused. Instead, they um, agreed to come here, which is, which is a start, but we can't make any decisions. We can make recommendations how things could be improved, but we can't um, take a decision. Uh, and I appreciate the exec board may, might find it very difficult to, but I think nevertheless, it, it should go back there. But I also think that we need to come forward with some real progress here. It's gone on for 40 odd years, I should think. Uh, and we've come to the stage where unless the council can guarantee, and I must put one point in here, I, Quite rightly, I, I received comments last week 
from, from residents who were somewhat put out about the press coverage there'd been. Um, well, press coverage is inevitable when documents become public like this, and, and these did. But it seemed to them and to me, it was almost, the whole argument was painted as a question of putting house prices up. It's not nothing of the sort. It's about providing essential council services that people pay for efficiently when they're wanted uh, on a regular basis. And, it, and it, it too often isn't happening. And I'm not sure what, what we recommend. What, what can we say to the different departments of the council? You have to educate all members of staff as to the geography of the city of Leeds. Is that what you've got to do? I mean, quite frankly, they ought to know anyway, but, but I, I think that um, the residents will be disappointed and rightly so. And I would like to have seen another step another step in the road to making the Royal Mail take decision about postcodes, which actually, as Mr Woolley said earlier on, would, would actually be a win-win situation for everybody. Mr Carlo. Thanks, Chair. I think I just wanted to bring up, Councillor Carter brings up an important example here because we've got the residents of the BD3 area here. And what seems to be the problem for them is areas like Driglington, people are well aware that it's in a BD postcode, but in Leeds. But what we've got here is a number of residents who live in Thornbury as per, as per the, the Royal Mail. And obviously Thornbury, everyone knows, is an area of Bradford. Therefore, these streets are wrongly classified uh, above others. We have got the area of Tyersall, but I think there's... There's knowledge, at least in many, that Tyersall is split across different areas. And that's why this area faces some of the wider problems, because it's an immediate assumption. Not least because obviously we've got a street where one side of the road is in Leeds and the other side of the road is in Bradford, yet they both share the same postcode. And that can be an incredibly difficult matter. So uh, I think it, it's useful that the report notes that for these residents to, to show the hard work they've done. But also the report does quite clearly say that changing the postcode would solve some of the issues. So it is a shame agree with Councillor Carter on this one that here we are discussing what the other solutions could be that the council or other bodies could put in place when actually at the top of the chain Royal Mail could solve this issue with as far as I see for for the small amount of residents in the Sunnybanks area which this report covers not much of a, an impact on the operational needs of Royal Mail as a service so I'll leave it there I think but We agree with each other. The Granges and indeed Tyersley, if you put them all together, you're not talking about a massive disruption or dislocation of the Royal Mail's business. But the reason that Sunnybank was, was, was picked, really, it was because of all the work the residents had done in, on their small estate. And it seemed to both the Member of Parliament and myself that it was a, an excellent place to start because if we could make that step, then the, follow, the other steps would inevitably follow, indeed might follow immediately. Um, but, that you, but Peter's right. I mean, everyone knows Driglington is in Leeds. The very fact it's Thornbury to, the, to someone not from Pudsey thinks Bradford, and it's not Bradford. And uh, I think Mr. Woolley will remember us standing underneath the sign that said Leeds, uh, Pudsey, when it was in the wrong place to highlight the fact that we were actually standing well inside Leeds and not on the boundary um, <clears throat> with Bradford. And that finally got changed, but that was a small step. And I think certainly the Calvin and Farsley Wood Councils are all agreed we would like to have seen another step um, and really to say give a string of and, and, and I appreciate all good intentions to remind departments to do this I mean it's been going on 40 years mm. <laughs> how much reminding do people actually need so I think you need to go back to whoever you're going back to and I wish it was the exec board, and I, the, the exec board are ducking it, are ducking the issue, um, and say, look, this as it stands is, is 
not good, a decent enough reward for all the hard work the residents have put in. That's my view. It's, it is not a good enough response. And I think there needs to be uh, something far more tangible and that the residents can point to it as a success. And indeed, that will benefit all the other BD postcode areas in Leeds because it will benefit them as well. And I would like to think we can find another step to try and put the final pressure on the Royal Mail to do what they ought to do and change the postcode. So that there. Um, during my early working life, I just worked up the road, English Electric, and I, I'm quite aware of where the old Pudsey boundary went and where the BD postcodes were, and the trouble it used to cause to some of my workmates, even that, even in them days. And you know, I mean, I think when we had the proper when when we had the BD and LSs and you know the the, the number and then the two letters on them. It was about 1968, 1969 when they did that, which is only what six years, five six years before we reorganised local government. And you would have thought on that. I mean, all right, I know Ilkley's got an LS postcode. I'm not, I'm not saying going as far as that, but on these little bits where uh, there's a few streets that's in one authority with a postcode for, for a different authority, we should be able to do something about it. And uh, I, I know myself that not only from, from a service point of view, but if you want insurance, if you've got a, if you've got a different postcode, your insurance can be higher, or you can't get insurance in, in some areas, because in that post, and that happens actually in LS, post, LS postcodes as well, um, you don't, you, you can't get the same things there. So I, I just, I just find it stupid that we've been on forty odd years about this. And I remember my my old friend Frank when he was a councillor, uh, Carvely councillor, uh, going on and on and on about this at, at various meetings. And uh, you know, I, I think I think it's an easy thing to solve, and you should be able to do it. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Yes, I think it is deeply disappointing that the Royal Mail haven't taken this on board and they haven't acknowledged even the distress that it has caused some of the residents. Um, I've had a number of people come to me that can't get into the local GP. They've been sent to Bradford, been refused to go to a Leeds GP. Um, emergency services have been confused on occasions, the police included. Deep, deeply saddening that they won't even recognise it. it. It would mean nothing to them to change the postcode. It wouldn't mean that they would change the operation. They just change the name of the postcode. That's all they needed to do. It's a, it's a great pity. Unfortunately, all we can do is acknowledge the contents of the report. It is all down to the Royal Mail and thank the officers from the council for their hard work in this. Thank you. member and with our disappointment it's not been taken to the exec board for discussion and also to, to ask as well that uh, we want we want to see some tangible benefits to the residents for their efforts in terms of proper recognition by council services and that 40 years of missed this missed that missed the other mistaken is too long and that's really what what uh, is concerning that that and, and, and no way is it a criticism of the officers across no way at all i think they've gone as far as they as they possibly could but but they aren't your departments you're talking about here um and if they haven't known understood for 40 years where they're supposed to be going what hope is there now but we need to see something that's that that's more positive for the residents. Is everybody happy with that recommendation? Yep, okay. Can we do that, Mike, please? Okay, on to the next item, which is item 11. And it's the climate emergency update. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, do I need to share my screen if I've got a presentation pack? 
Uh, yes, please, Emma, if you if you can, if you're on, the, on Zoom, yeah. you're on the Zoom and then just share screen. It says the host has disabled attendee share screen, uh, screen sharing. Sorry, Emma, what did it say? Uh, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Should have mentioned you've got about 10 minutes for your uh, representation as well thank you i'll be as quick as i can <laughs> Let you share now because we've got the best. Do we maybe want to swap agenda items and come back to mine whilst we deal with the technical difficulties? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. All right, I was just saying, should we maybe swap around the agenda items whilst we deal with the uh, technical difficulties? If it's We'll do that. Thank you. So on to the next item on the agenda. We'll come back to item 11. It's uh, item 12, highways, the winter services update. We've already had technical difficulties with that. Hopefully we've overcome them now. Hello. Yes, I think I think we have. Oh, we've, we've, we've got a workaround. So Mike, has, um, I, do, I don't have access to Zoom on um, on my desktop. So Mike's kindly agreed to present the presentation on my behalf so um, it could be a little bit tricky and um, because you used to clicking it on yourself as you go along but hopefully between us we'll be able to uh, make it work um i'll try and keep it as brief as possible because i'm aware of uh, the packed agenda and the time scales that we've got but i'm from highways and transportation and i work for the um the, the department that deals with the, the winter service I'm relatively new to the service but i've been working with my colleagues to see if we can be, um, be a bit more informative um, about the services that we do, both to the public and to the elected members. Um, so hence I'm here today, just to give a quick overview of our winter service. It's quite timely. Um, sort of the weather's getting a bit colder now. Um, on a positive note, it's only another seven weeks before it starts getting lighter again, but I'll crack on with it and hopefully it goes well. Okay, so if you can click onto the next slide, please, uh, please Mike. Right, the winter service plan, um, we've got a set of duties to do that's out, outlined in the Highways Act of 1918. It's three principal points, really. The gritting of roads, the refilling of salt bins, and snow plough and snow clearing. Um, a few headline facts. Um, did you know that um, our gritters drive an average 51,200 miles per year during the winter period, which equates to around two circumferences of the, the, the earth? And between... we. Each year, we use between 12,800 and 16,000 tonnes of salt each year, um, gritting our services. Obviously, it does depend on the severity of, of, of the winter. How do we decide where we grit? We, we've, you know, there's quite a lot of science that goes behind this, but we, we, we can't grit every road. If we were to grit every road in Leeds, um, we'd have to be gritting right throughout the year, including June, July, through all the summer months, and that would just be ridiculous because it's obviously not gritty there. Um, so we've got to have some form of categorization and, and the, this, the, the next slide, if you just pop that on Mike for me, if you could. Um, sorry, the next one on. Um, this, this, this slide here shows basically what categories that we do. We've got a category 1A, which is uh, the resilient salting network, and that includes emergency routes leading to hospitals and major infrastructure. Category 1, the primary salting ne network, PSN, which includes bus routes and school links. Category two, the second salting network, it's um, medium business areas, shopping areas, doctor surgeries, medical centers and the such. And then we've got category three, three, which is any other road that we can get round to doing when we've done the, the other three category roads. So um, it's, 
it, it's quite a difficult one, really, when when trying to prioritise these and and people, a lot of people are under the misinterpretation that we do grit every every road. But as I've just alluded to now, that that would be sort of an impossibility due to the amount of road surveying road network that we've got in Leeds at the moment. Um, one of the main contacts that we get, and and I'm sure many of you members get that as as well, is during inclement weather and so on a snowy period and what you probably get a lot of calls to say that why ain't my road being gritted and so on and um we, we certainly do get a lot of um, contacts through the call center to that effect so we, 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 if if you can just click on to the next slide mike um we've we've done a little infographic there which we hope to get publicized and we can circle it circle it out to to all members and so on which sort of breaks down sort of the rationale of what roads are done and what roads aren't done. And it gives a good sort of like indication to members of the public as to, to, to why we've come to that decision of what roads are going to be known or what roads aren't we going to do uh, that we don't do. Um, I'm not going to go through it for the, for, for the sheer fact that we don't really have the time. It took me quite a while to go through, but it's quite a simple um, inf information documented to read through and, and understand. And we hope to get this publicised on our website in the new uh, early in the next few months when we've managed to update the site if you can go on to the next slide please mike when we decide to grit road it's not just sort of a, a sort of a finger in the air thinking it's going to be cold tonight we do have quite a few mechanisms to detect road temperature and so on we've got two monitoring stations one over in the eden area and one in the windmore area and they detect the ambient road temperature and air temperature and that dictates to us whether we go out to grit our roads we also work with a, um, a weather forecasting company who gives us long range weather forecasts and also could give us a good heads up as to um, what nights we will have um, the gritters out on the roads. As you can see there, if, uh, we're on the right slide. Um, we've introduced, you might have seen them, we've got smaller quad bikes now to do some, to clear snow in some of the harder to get areas where the larger trucks can't get historically. And that's mainly around uh, sort of like town centres and city centres and so on. And that's been proving very effective. If you could go to the next slide, please, uh, Mike. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we, a lot of a lot of people do contact our our the council's contact centre to, to say, um, you know, what is my road being gritted? What roads are we going to grit and so on? And I won't go through all these categories here, but so we, we've sort of listened to the the public there and listened to people's concerns, and we've worked with other authorities and researched what they've done back best practice and so on and what we've come up with now is a, is, a, is a new addition to our website and it's called the the gritter tracking um, system and that enables members of the public if you can just click onto the next slide Mike that in, it enables members of the public to be able to to go onto the council's website go through the winter service um, portal and they can track gritters in Leeds so we can look at gritters where they are in Leeds where they've been and where they're going and if i can just give you a quick demonstration mike if you just click on that live button there that takes you into the portal it'll be slightly different to this in the real world but this is just for demonstration purposes at the moment just to for today i don't know if you give it another click mike did work earlier when we tried it, honestly. <laughs> it, it is quite a large file, so it, sometimes it can take quite a while to load. Well, it's a shame if we can't get it up, but I could probably um, give a little bit of a talk on it around it, um, and let's see if it comes up while I'm speaking, if it does great. If not, like I say, I'll, I'll see if I can cover most of it. I don't know if you can see on that map there, there's a map. It's uh, an area of Leeds, uh, looking at roundy area there. I think this is a snapshot that I put on for instances where it probably didn't work, but it usually does, to be honest. Um, what you do, you'd, you'd, you click on that live link and you'd be presented with a screen just like that with a map there. And there's a facility on there where you can type in your postcode. And if you type in your postcode, it will zoom into your area and it'll show you the, the local network around you. And there's several layers that you can click on. There's like a menu to one side and it'll click on it. Uh, salting routes so I'll click on the salting route and it will show if you're on a salting route or not it will also show you if there is a gritter 
in your area at the time gritting and it is sort of real life It's a five minute lag so if you're looking at a gritter on a road say roundy road in leeds um within a couple of minutes it'll have updated and that gritter will be further down the road and it will be leaving a, a marker where it has gritted so you'll be able to think well i'm okay to go down roundy road because that road's been gritted at the moment um which is useful um, because that'll make give, give people the you know some 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 good information whether to make an informed decision whether to travel during inclement weather. Um, there's also other layers that you can add on to that. Things like there's a tab for grit bins, so you can see where your nearest grit bin is. Um, as amongst other things, I won't go into them obviously because of time. It doesn't look like it's going to come on, does it, Mike? I'm going to ask somebody for a postcode so we could have a little uh, go on it. It's you know we, we tried for the interactive bit, but I do apologise about that. Um, I will say it does, it, it may sound a great solution at the moment and a great thing to have, you know, it is early stages, it's the first year that we've launched it. Um, there are going to be some quick tweaks and things that we make along. We are going to get some recommendations. Um, and we still have a few little quirks to iron out and what have you. So it's not a perfect scenario at the moment. And we will be putting a few disclaimers on the website um just to say that because it is new technology and the, we've had a, quite a bit of difficulty in interacting the different um platforms it is not my um sort of my expertise really so um we've been working with our it to see if we can iron those out and we're sort of looking to move with the times a little bit more now we, we're promoting a lot of the work that we do on the social media pl platforms such as facebook twitter and so on our council council's insight we've got connecting leads links now website where connecting leads can do feeds directly into people's facebook and twitter accounts that can say right there's a blocked road or inclement weather difficult to pass in this area there's road works in this area and so on so we are sort of like up in our game in terms of contact with the with with with, with the public but we do maintain the traditional routes as uh, you know people can call in for information and in our contact center at any time so that's that's it in a nutshell. Um, so if there's any questions anybody would like to ask, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, first thing, for, for us that are somewhat IT challenged, uh, could you send us something out how to get onto, onto this screen thing? Uh, I'm, I'm probably not the only one that will be thinking that. Uh, and the other thing is, you see, it, pick, it picks up grip bins. Does it pick up blue ones as well? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I really did. And uh, and I, I, I sort of was going to mention it in the presentation, but at the moment, no, it doesn't pick up the, the blue bit, bit, buttons, which I know are uh, supported by the community committees and so on. It's We've just got the yellow ones at the moment because we do have that exact information because that's on our database. So it was sort of easy to load at the time. The blue bins are a little bit of an anomaly. We, we are picking that intelligence up and it's something that we do intend to do in the future. It's not being overlooked. I can assure you that, but um, as I said, it is work in progress and we will keep you updated on that. The, the reason I ask is, is um, uh, for, for, for just for information, uh, I have a blue bin uh, that they put in the wrong place and I had trouble getting it moved. And uh, I got the local residents. One of them has a little fork truck, right. and he picked it up and moved it to where it should be. And I just wanted to make sure it were on, it were down where it where, where we moved it to. <laughs> I'm I'm hopeful that, that that you will be able to see that in you know yeah. in uh, on 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 your screen anytime soon. And there will be, um, I mean, the, the yellow beans on the system are, are yeah. yellow on the system, and the blue beans will be blue beans when we manage to yeah. get them loaded on yeah. and that, that information loaded. And I can certainly send you the link to the um, to the website where it'll take you straight to the tracking system. Could you ask that you send it to all of us, and then we can all set up our game? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Seary, then Councillor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Gritting and grit bins and winter is, is very one of my passions, really, because we live in Pudsey, top of the hill, one of the highest places in Leeds. Last four years, we've bought 70 grit bins to help our residents. You mentioned that you've got um, weather station in Yeadham, but I remember probably two years ago where there were no snow anywhere else apart from Pudsey, and we didn't get a single grit. There. And we challenged highways and they went, well, you don't need them. But it was, it was solid in the centre of Pudsey, yeah. So 
yeah, can we have Pudsey picked up separately, please? Because obviously the weather comes over from a different side. Another one as well, he showed a little quad bike going through shopping centre. We've never seen one in town centre. Yeah, we, we do have a, you know, a busy town centre, so I'd appreciate if we could get our towns done as well. And then also we've spent like £500,000 on walking and cycling routes through our, our ward. Are these going to be picked up with the gritting routes so people can get to the train stations and things like that? Because the gritting route is just... It's quite old, it's not being changed, it's not been looked at recently, and I just wondered if that would be picked up. Thank you. Councillor Smith, then Councillor Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I was going to pick up the monitoring station element as well, because putty has got its own microclimate, as we know. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is the accuracy of your yellow bins. We've just had um, an exercise with our street bins and found out that most of them are missing. <laughs> um, so how accurate are your yellow bins? Has anybody actually checked them? Um, another thing was when you fill your grit bins, do you um, check them, empty them for rubbish, check them for splits, put new lids on, things like that, because some of them aren't in the best state of repair. Um, and then going back to the gritting quad, um, are they used to grit the retirement life complexes? Because year on year, we tend to have to get um, residents out and ourselves and grit them ourselves. And if we have that as a, an option, then um, we'd like it to be utilised, please. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Can I ask you to pick them all up at the end, the questions all up at the end? Right, Councillor Carter. Yes, we have, <clears throat> we have an interesting situation in Carverley and Farsley Road. The A647, which has been mentioned before today, uh, is the main Leeds Bradford Road. Um, and since uh, the cycleway was erected or constructed, we have also have a little contraption that comes toddling along and clears the snow from the cycleway. Unfortunately, it dumps it all onto the footpath. So nobody can then walk down the footpaths on the A647 uh, because all the snow has been moved from the cycleway and shoved onto the footway. It's also a school walking route. It's the route a lot of children, thankfully, young people, I should say, thankfully used to walk to Preethorpe School as opposed to coming in a taxi or a car, which far too many of them do. Um, but of course then, when all this ice and snow is pushed into it, it's impassable. And I have to tell you, there is nothing but nothing stirs the residents up quite rightly, like watching something come down a cycleway and shove the snow onto the footpath. I can, uh, I can imagine that. Could you just mention the, 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 the name again? I just missed it when I was- The A647. The A647. It's the main road to Bradford. And the other point is we, like Pudsey, we have uh, a number of our own bins. We have 31 uh, bins that you don't fill that uh, ward members have just coughed up to fill again. Um, why don't you bring your prices down so we can get our bins filled by you as well. <coughs> For the prices you charge, we'd be out of business. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't fix the prices, but um, I can, uh, I'll certainly take your comments back and they are welcome. Have we got any more questions before I ask for the... No? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I think there's a couple of questions um, somebody wanted answering. Yeah. Sorry. I think, Chair, did you mention you wanted me to come back separately at the end, or did you want me to write them up and, and circulate them round with them? Be quite quite a few questions. I've got them all written down. I can. If you if you could answer them now, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Okay then. Um, of course, Council Blackburn, I will send you the link out. Um, Obviously, I can't do that at the moment. Um, you mentioned about, uh, Councillor, about a putsy having a bit of a, a microclimate. I, I agree with you in that sense because there are some of the areas I live in quite on just the way out towards Harrogate in Leeds and, and where I live, we have got a sort of a microclimate. Um, yes, in an ideal world, it would be good to have, and we are looking into this, but it is down to 
um, a lot of it's down to research, sources, research, and 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 the technology be able to do that. I mean, of course, it is there, but because we've been looking at some newer types of technology that can fit onto lamp posts that, that can detect road temperature and so on, so we can sort of like work in a smart way and just do the roads actually that need doing. But I do agree with you. When I call up highways, they don't send one out. They don't need a monitor. You know what I mean? They just need action, really. Yeah. So yeah. is there any going to do small areas or are you just going to concentrate citywide? Well, at the moment, it is sort of it, it is citywide, but we, we are we are looking to refine that a little bit more and make it more fit for purpose in terms of sort of tailor-made for individual areas, because you rightly say that that's, that some areas don't, don't have any, any issues whatsoever and others have, have their own sort of microclimate and, and quite severe weather when other areas, are, they haven't even got any frost. Um, but we, we, we are looking in, into better mechanisms of dealing with this. And, but I'll certainly take your comments back to our head of service and, and 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 see if we can find a more comprehensive answer for you. As I said, I'm sort of limited with the information that I've got with me quite now, but I can certainly go back and look into that for you. But any rows, as you alluded to earlier, that 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 were frozen should have been picked up and should have been gritted at that time. I can only imagine that there was a problem on that particular day and the, the, the gritters couldn't get there for whatever reason. It's not a perfect system. It should be, but they do sometimes mess. It could be down to sort of mechanical failure, um, driver availability and so on, but that is very rare. We do, you know, we usually get round to gritting them all. I'm sure it was an isolated service, but I, I certainly will mention that. Okay. Um, about the retirement life, you mentioned about the um, the quad bikes, um, clearing out the cycle routes and so on. Being open and honest, we do... We only have a few of the quad bikes in the city and we, we, we can't get, we're looking at about, uh, the, the last count that we had, I believe was four, but they're on about procuring some more. Um, I will find out if that if that is in, in process of being done at the moment and double check the numbers. Um, and I'll have to get, right, get back to you on that one, councillor. But as you can imagine, We've got hundreds and hundreds of cycle routes now. We are we are looking as Lee's rolling out more cycle routes. It's one of our priorities to do that. We are going to have to up this game in terms of um, gritting the cycle routes, but that cycle routes are are treated with the saline solution. It's a different method of doing it as we do with the roads, and cycle routes should be should be treated what's practically possible. I know that's quite. I'm not trying to evade the point there, but it's all about practicalities and the the ability to be able to do it. We, we're increasing the cycle network quite a speed. We just need to up our game in being able to grit and keep those roads, uh, those those networks free as we go along. And we are playing catch up to, in all honesty, and hopefully we will be up in our game and, and, and trying to get the, all, all the cycle rules included in, in our network. But at the moment, it's impossible to do so, but it, it is on our radar and you rightly do bring that up. Yes. And in the You're blocking the footpaths. So the cyclists may be able to cycle, but not many do, particularly in the winter. But if you want to walk on the footpath, you've got to walk through all the slush and snow that's been thrown up by the little gadget that's gone down the cycleway. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You're right. That's that that's I was coming on to the one on the A60 A647 that you mentioned. Um, that shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't be doing that. So that's something I'll have to take back to our operations team and, and um, get that resolved for you. Smith, you had an additional question. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm just a little bit concerned why we would take so much time, trouble and effort to clear cycle paths when there's unlikely to be many um, cyclists on there in this extreme weather yet we don't seem to want to clear the retirement life complexes where there's elderly people that need to get out and about and um, get the shopping and uh, things like that. So that's just a little bit of a concern. Yeah, I, um, it is a good concern. And, that, and that's, and, and I take your points on view there. And that's something we, we, we can take back and review 
and uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you an update on that one. At the moment, retirement life complexes are not being done. Um, but if that's something that you're asking for, we will look into doing that and see if we see what we can do. As again, in a perfect world, we would grit everywhere um, that, 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 that needs gritting, but we don't have the resources and the funds to be able to do that. Um, and I'd, we, without trying to dodge the question, we, we will see if we can bring those on board, but we will, I'll try and get a more comprehensive answer to you as soon as possible. But thanks for raising that. Any more questions, queries? Councillor Siri. Councillor Dawn Siri. Sorry, just to clarify, are there any plans? We've spent thousands and thousands of pounds um, linking the Putty bus station down to the train station and similar things across the city. Are there any plans for the, these pathways to be gritted alongside the cycleways? Has is, is that been planned in that scheme or is it um, something that will be additional? That's something. That's something that'll be additional at the moment. Um, but again, it's it's something that I can take back to our service department heads and um, and mention that to them and see if we can get some information on you on that one. Thank you. Um, just just to add to what Councillor Andrew Carter was saying that uh, and Councillor Trish Smith, uh, we do regard our elderly people's complexes as a priority because if the elderly people do get out and slip, it, it can be extremely serious for them. And it then, in term, monetary terms, it puts pressure on the NHS and other services as well, council services. So we, we do, in particular, find that a priority. Okay, we're to the next one now, which is back to item 11. Are we IT perfect? Brilliant, thank you very much. I'll go ahead. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I've got a slide deck that hopefully showcases the work that we've been doing in response to the climate emergency. Conscious that I've got 10 minutes and 22 slides, I'm not quite sure how the maths of that is going to work out, but I'll get through it as quickly and as efficiently as I can. So just starting off with a little bit of background, uh, back in 2019, Leeds City Council declared a climate emergency. And as part of our response to the climate emergency, we initiated the Big Leads Climate Conversation, where we went out to consultation um, citywide to get people's views and opinions on, on what we should be doing to respond to, uh, to, respond, sorry, to the challenge that we face. 97% of respondents thought that businesses and public sector organisations have a responsibility to reduce their carbon emissions. And, and that feedback really set the scene for us going forwards. The next slide that you can see uh, is a slide that was developed by the Leeds uh, Climate Commission. And what this slide does is it sets out what needs to be done locally uh, and the costs of doing so to actually get us to net zero by 2030. Um, so as you can see, sort of halfway along the slide, we've got some um, what have been termed cost effective options uh, to pursue around better housing and transport. And then the slide moves on to more ambitious options and the innovations that are needed to actually get us to net zero. So it's fair to say we've, we've got quite a challenge ahead of us. In respect of air quality, um, Leeds air quality is now significantly below legal limits. Um, we actually discontinued the clean air zone proposals back in October 2020. Uh, the clean air zone proposals were discontinued because Leeds actually achieved its air quality ambitions ahead of going live with the clean air zone. Um, so following a joint review between us and central government, uh, we actually discontinued, um, like I say, back in October 2020. What's replaced the clean air zone proposals is a new air quality strategy. Uh, that air quality strategy was approved by the executive board um, earlier on this year, I believe it was July. Uh, that air quality strategy sets out additional actions that we're taking to improve air quality um, from transport, but it also brings in a scope, uh, domestic emissions, industrial emissions and agricultural emissions. So there's quite a lot of activity going on across the council uh, in respect of that agenda. Coming on to our buildings, 47% uh, of the city's carbon footprint comes from heating and powering our homes. So with that in mind, we're going through quite a lot of retrofit activity, um, improving insulation, improving um, methods of heating, installing solar panels and LED lighting. 
uh, we're looking at lots and lots of different ways to leverage funding to deliver these improvements, not just in our own buildings, but also in the city's housing stock as well. Um, improving the energy efficiency of buildings has lots of benefits. Not only does it save money, um, it helps to tackle fuel poverty. It helps to improve um, health related outcomes uh, in addition to actually responding to the climate emergency. Some of the funding that we've leveraged is targeted at improving the carbon footprint of our own corporate uh, stock. Um, recently, we secured just over 25 million pounds to decarbonize around 40 of our public sector buildings. Specifically in Outer West, this means that we're installing air source heat pumps and solar panels at Adult Primary School uh, and Spring Gardens Home for Older People. We're also doing an air source heat pump at Airbra Leisure Centre and also at um, Suffolk Court, which I believe is now um, called the Northwest Recovery Hub. Coming on to the uh, energy efficiency of housing, we plan to invest £100 million on improving uh, the energy efficiency of our housing stock over the next five years. Primarily, this is going to be fed through connections to the district's heating network. Um, but we're also looking at broadening our, our approach to energy efficiency works at homes across Leeds, looking at um, external wall insulation, structural improvements and central heating. Specifically in our West, we're looking at um, a scheme for homeowners on low incomes um, around eligibility for uh, solar panels. That's a scheme that we're currently rolling out. Uh, landlords can also tap into that scheme as well. The next slide just covers uh, some more work that is going on across the area. Um, Holt Park is set to benefit from a major green refurbishment programme. Uh, this will improve uh, 190 flats through retrofits, um, air source heat pumps and solar panels, and a, a variety of fabric improvements. Coming on to transport, again, transport has got quite a large carbon footprint in the city. Uh, currently, 38% of the city's carbon footprint comes from travelling uh, through work and leisure, primarily from cars. Um, in the city, we've um, got quite an ambitious transport strategy. Uh, we're looking to improve active travel and public transport um, infrastructure. We've also given free parking, free electric vehicle trials, and we're currently installing public charge points to accelerate transition to electric vehicles. Um, within our own fleet, we've got more low emission vehicles than any other authority in the UK. I believe we've currently got about 330 electric vans and we're about to procure a number of um, electric refuse collection vehicles as well. So we're really trying to um, lead by example. The next slide is just a bit more data about the electric vehicle trials. Um, we've given out lots and lots of vehicles for lots of businesses across Leeds. Um, businesses in uh, the Outer West area have participated and we're also um, in the process of installing a number of uh, rapid electric vehicle charge points within the ward areas. Just coming on to wildlife and biodiversity. Can you just talk a minute? Uh, Councillor Seary. The examples you're giving are all out in Northwest. Oh. And not put the, well, you know, Carla family. Sorry. I apologize about that. Um, this is the slide deck I've been provided with. Uh, just one minute. Apologies. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. That's pretty embarrassing. Just give me a minute. Try again. <laughs> Can we all see the slides? <clears throat> right, okay. Here we go. Is that better? Farsley. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. 
Okay, so um, just a really, really quick recap then. Um, under the public sector decarbonisation scheme, we're installing um, air source heat pumps and solar panels at Farsley Farfield and unfortunately Pudsey Lane. Yeah, sorry, but I think we've drawn on Yeah, it's been, it's been dropped from scope. Um, the, the problem at Pudsey Leisure Centre is related to the structural condition of the building. Uh, we're not able to put solar panels on the roofs and there is not enough space in the plant room to put the air source heat pump in. So we're currently exploring if there's any other options at Pudsey Leisure Centre to decarbonise. Energy efficiency of housing. Um, Yep, I think that update is applicable. Uh, yep, that's the same update. Transport, nothing specific on there. Um, electric vehicle trials, um, yep, businesses in your board areas have participated in the trials and we're delivering three uh, rapid EVCPs um, at Charles Street Car Park, Aston Wortley and Pudsey Leisure Centre. Sorry about that. Right, that's where I was. Um, <laughs> wildlife and biodiversity. So, um, Lots of coverage uh, in the media at the minute about um, the threat to the UK's biodiversity um, and what we really need to do in the city around uh, protecting uh, biodiversity. We are looking at planting more wildflower meadows and using relaxed mowing uh, to support pollinating insects. Um, and we also have some ambitious plans for natural flood management. We are also um, delivering the White Rose Forest strategy. Um, so the White Rose Forest is a community forest for North and West Yorkshire. Uh, we aim to increase, increase our tree canopy cover uh, from 17% to 33% by 2050. Um, and we're doing this by working in partnership with landowners, institutions, businesses, communities, as well as volunteers from the White Rose Partnership. So how the White Rose Forest works, uh, parts and countryside team um, plant trees on council owned land every year. And what our service does is we promote the planting of trees on privately whoops, and institutionally owned land. Uh, so both of these schemes combined contribute towards the White Rose Forest. The next slide is just a bit of um, information about why it's beneficial to plant trees. Um, and how tree planting can be supported uh, through a mixture of donations, land identification, and uh, through time uh, volunteering to participate in tree planting schemes. Just a bit of an ask to members, if you are aware of any land that could be utilised for tree planting, um, our email address is woodlandcreation at leeds.gov.uk. Um, if you could just send those through to our team, that would be gratefully received. The next slide is just an image of um, a sign that we've developed with parks and countryside so that we can let people know um, why we're doing wildflower planting. Um, so it's just to indicate that it's a, a pollinator friendly area. Similarly, uh, we've also developed a sign for relaxed mowing. Quickly moving on to food and waste. Um, we have recently signed up to the Glasgow Food Climate Commitment. Uh, this commitment pledges to accelerate integrating food policies uh, to tackle climate change. So we're currently investigating what the council can do to decarbonise uh, the city's emissions from food. We have a pretty well-developed communications strategy. Um, we've enhanced this on the back of the Big Leads Climate Conversation through developing hyper-local communications. This is where we try to tap into local channels of comms so that we can get communities involved uh, to understand what action's been taken in their local area uh, and, and as well how they can work with us to promote our schemes um, take advantage of some of the schemes that are on offer, such as the, the solar panel uh, funding, etc. We have a, a climate newsletter. We've got over 5,000 subscribers. Um, we would like more people to sign up to our newsletter. So please sign up if you haven't already done so. And I think that takes us through to the end of the slides. Uh, sorry, that got a bit confusing in the middle. <laughs> but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? Um, Councillor David Blackburn. I've just got a couple uh, to start with. Uh, on tree planting. What's the survival rate of the, all these whips that we've planted? Um, 
I know Councillor Forsyth before lockdown and I went and planted loads, but I can't see no evidence. I mean, it's a few fields away from front from, from road. I, I can't see a lot of evidence of of a, a forest growing there uh, since since we did done that. And we and I understand we pe we're planting more whips in my ward because of all fields, all these fields we've got, and they have done any 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 other ward in in, in city. Uh, but I'm just concerned about the survival rate. The other thing on solar panels, and uh, I know quite a bit about this from scheme we did on council houses uh, that I worked with Councillor Dobson on. And one of the things we found there was the great problem with solar panels was, was how you were connected to the system. And you get, say for instance, on, on, on a council estate, you get one side of the road, it's, it's connected in parallel, but other sides connected in series. So if you've got three houses on, on the side that were connected in series, what I finished up is you'd be pumping that much electricity and you burnt system out. So you couldn't do it there, you know, which would have, uh, and I've got, I've got to say when they did it, they probably didn't realise that that caused a problem because I didn't think about solar panels, didn't they? Uh, on, on the other side, it works out. And the other thing was, was, the substations in some areas weren't sufficient to take the electricity, electricity in. They were all right at distributing it, but not taking it back. Have we talked with electrical supply companies about change? I mean, I've got to say it's a major job to do this, but uh, over time, changing the, changing the system so that more and more people can have solar panels if they want. Oh, and the, oh just final point as well. Uh, on your on your things about round here, and it might be my eyesight, uh, I don't know, but uh, you didn't seem to mention the the, the scheme that we had on Heights East and West uh, multi-storey flats where we put in ground source um, heating, heat pump, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lawton. Can I ask you to pick up all the questions at the end when all when other councillors have, yeah. So I've got next, uh, Councillor Trish Smith. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I recently raised with um, Polly the um, possibility of electric ice cream vans being subsidised in some way. Um, we have them driving around the city constantly. We have them standing in parks for hours on end at times um, with no electric charging points in most parks um, and seemingly no way forward other than the diesel generator. So um, that I think I'd like to see move forward, please. Um, we've been offered some charging points in our ward. I don't know how other wards fare, but they're not rapid on street charging points. And the residents are laughing at us, basically. <laughs> um, so that's one thing that I'd like to pick up. Um, a tree management policy, please. We're planting all these trees and the ones that survive will need managing. Um, so we need to think about that. And to David's point about the ground source heat pumps, we've um, well, I've fought very, very hard <laughs> to bring the Rycroft ground source heat pumps forward. And um, they're currently underway now, but again, no mention of them in the presentation, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Right. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I think that, that the council's done some pretty um, amazing things already straight away. I'm really pleased about you know, the EV trials for delivery vehicles and um, cargo bikes and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the tree planting, um, and especially connected with what Councillor Blackburn has just said, inevitably some of the whips that have been planted are not going to survive. But the fact of the matter is that the tree planting is about mitigation. We're talking about that being helpful decades down the line. That's not about carbon reduction right now. That's the, it's really important that we're doing it. Don't get me wrong. I'm completely in favor of that, but we just need to make sure that the message is not, oh, we'll plant some trees, that'll be fine because it won't. So that's one point. Okay, um, has there been any, um, any work done about identifying areas that can just rewild? Because there's actually lots and lots of little pockets of land, and we know where all of them are, that can just be left. 
and possibly even more and even, I don't know, some signage or even that people will know that that's, those areas are just literally being left to rewild or rather to wild. And finally, and I keep talking about this, um, verges and hedges. And I realize this is more highways and the planting of hedges might, they, they, they grow pretty rapidly as well. And so I know the concentration has been on thinking about the tree planting, but um, that will be another one, especially to help with the air quality as well along roadway roads and things. Thanks. Any other, uh, Councillor Lamplock there. Um, yes, Chair. <clears throat> I agree with Councillor Forsyth that there does seem to be a lot of feeling in the council that if they go out and plant loads of trees, that somehow this is going to sort of check or, or should I say, um, improve the climate change problem. Well, a tree takes years to, to grow <clears throat> and... Uh, in any case, but it's just to me a fair small thing that can be done. It certainly isn't. Uh, it isn't a thing that's going to make such a major difference that everybody can be saying, "Oh, we can go out." Yes, which I know, and has been said in council. You know, that there's a lot of feeling. I think with with certain councils oh, if we do that that's gonna that's going to make a big difference and so uh you know that'll cause how that will sort out half the problem well it won't i'm nothing against people planting trees i know what they're doing is they're planting more trees than they need to do uh when they plant out because they know a lot of them won't take and this is what uh uh, I've been told when I've asked by this because I have had residents concerned about the fact that the trees are just planted, nobody bothers watering them, and they just said, "Oh yes, well, some will take and some won't," and you know, so so that's what they're doing. Um, I think, as well as has been said, there's got to be some management. And this is half the problem. Winding back to when I first got elected and that, uh, some trees were put in place by housing. They didn't really think what trees they were putting in place and they had buries on. And then, then when the buries came off, they went on people's cars or people could slip on them and all this. But at the end of the day, who maintains those trees? Housing say, yes, it costs a lot of money to maintain them. Invariably, they don't get maintained. So whilst I have no problem with people planting trees at all, there is a management plan put in place for this particular scheme, but it's just for so many few years. Now, you know, okay, when, when these trees grow up and that, you know, so some of us will probably be underneath the trees by then but it's just making a problem for other people like we inherited problems with as I said monies to maintain trees properly so will so will future councillors because we're only thinking about a certain amount of money to do it for x amount of years a tree can live for a hundred and odd years I mean, yeah, it depends what sort of tree it is and that, but generally that's when when they do the most for the set carbon out of the atmosphere when you've got a fully, fully mature tree. But I think we've just got to think, right, where are we going to plant these trees and what money do we have going forward to maintain them? And we not. There's just this thing, oh, we're here, you know, we've got a bloody tree. <laughs> and... It hasn't been fully thought out. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, I've got Councillor Forsyth and Councillor David Blackburn. 
So just really quickly, something I thought just now is, have we been, I mean, the types of trees are important. Have we been looking at food trees, nut trees, um, all of that really, that was all. Yeah, um, I, I, I've got a question in an afterthought. It was something that Councillor Farsi mentioned, and, and then I thought, I'll ask this. I, I, a number of years ago, I went to West Cliff on Sea, which was in the late David Amos's constituency, yeah. South End, uh, South End uh, East, it's, uh, yeah, South End West, sorry. Uh, and um, there are some streets there where they don't have privet edges. I mean, don't, don't, sorry, they don't have um, they don't have um, grass verges. They actually have edges where where to grass verges, and they are superb. You don't get people parking on 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 the grass because they can't do. And I thought it was really good. And a number of times I've mentioned it to officers of this council, and it sort of disappeared into ether and never never returned. But have we thought about doing? Because actually. Uh, where you've got vehicles going down the street or road, if you've got an edge like that, they they actually take those the, the, those those emissions from the cars and stop them stop you breathing them in. Uh, so so the, the 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 very very good. And the other thing is they look really nice. Uh, I mean, and that's one of the things I've, I've got to say when you look at our grass verges, they don't look very nice at all half the time. So. Uh, can can somebody tell me if we've looked at it? Thank you, David. And I'd like to add to some of those points as well and underline some others. The ice cream vans, ice cream vans in our parks, churning out dirty diesel right next to the children's playground. Um, there seems to be no plan, as been mentioned earlier by other members, for planting trees and hedges. Cars are allowed to idle outside schools and other authorities, they're stopped from doing that. Why are planners not being asking developers to install solar panels at the planning stage? Why is that not happening? And my final point, this year the grass cutting has been absolutely appalling and I've had a string of excuses as why. One of the excuses was that ragwort is um, the feeding home of one of the butterflies. Well, let me tell you, that butterfly only exists in Devon and Cornwall. It can't live up here. And as Councillor David Blackburn has said, why don't we plant hedges along some of the main roads so that we can, it can mitigate pollution? Because the ragwort, because it's not being cut till July or August, is then flowering and the flowers are going into other fields, council fields, actually. Um, and the council's liable to prosecution for this then uh, that farm is being contracted out for hay. When ragwort is dry, it is palatable to animals and it kills them. And it's not a nice death, it's extremely painful. So I want to know why the council hasn't got a proper plan and um, some of the other answer, uh, questions that the councillors have asked. Am I good? <clears throat> Excuse me, am I good to respond now or is there any more questions? Yeah, okay. Um, so. Just picking up on the uh, tree planting plan and the survival of saplings. So when trees are planted, essentially the maintenance of trees involves trying to maintain the area around them and keeping that free from weeds. So once they've been planted by our parks and countryside department, they are then maintained by parks and countryside where we're taking um, donations or people are planting on their own private land, businesses, landholders, etc. What we're aiming to do through the White Rose Forest strategy is actually educate um people that are planting trees around what they need to do to maintain them into the long term so that's part of the the support and the strategy around the the planting um <clears throat> but definitely taking on board some of the comments that have been made about you know the types of trees um whether we're going to be considering hedges for verges and such like i can definitely feed that, that back into the team that's looking after the white rose forest strategy and and come back to you with with some comments on that <clears throat> Moving on to the question about uh, PV and connectivity um, when it's on different sides of the street, if, if I understood the uh, question correctly, um, that is something I would need to take away. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. What I can advise around um, substation upgrades and electricity infrastructure upgrades, certainly on the corporate side of things, that is something that we've run into um, on delivery of that project. 
just by way of example, we're having to construct five new electricity substations across the city to handle the new installations that are going in. Um, so, so essentially, when you put an air source heat pump into a building, what you're doing is you're displacing the use of gas. So you're using much less gas, but a lot more electricity. And then you put in solar panels on to offset that an, an additional electricity consumption. But obviously, those new solar panels still need to be supported by the infrastructure so certainly that is something that we've come across and, and we are handling that on a case-by-case -case basis as we work through our uh, program of delivery um, it's not just around uh, upgrading new substations though there's just certain uh, electrical infrastructure upgrades that need to happen some of these are pretty small scale stuff others are, are much more major so again that's something that's happening across the certainly the corporate side of the delivery of um, decarbonisation works um, also picked up on the comments about um, certain issues that were missing from the slides I must apologise I, I was provided with slides by our comms team and they inadvertently updated the wrong slide deck and sent me the wrong slide deck so I'm very sorry but I will get an updated version um, issued so everybody uh, that sits on the meeting so I am really sorry about that um ice cream vans yeah that that is the query that's uh, come across my desk my understanding is that there's not a great deal by way of solutions available for electric ice cream vans or where there are solutions they are very very expensive and because they are expensive it's obviously quite difficult to get ice cream vendors to entertain considering upgrading to them and there isn't a great deal of funding available at the minute minute to support that that being said we're aware that it's an issue we know it's an issue it is something in our team that we would like to try and address and do something about um, so again if, if we do come across any opportunities out in that regard we will pursue it um just try and see if there's anything else i think i've covered all of the questions um rewilding of areas yes that is something that we we're happy to take suggestions on uh, but i think everything else was was uh, around trees primarily uh planning as well around the development for solar panels at, at the planning stage we do um mandate the installation of electric vehicle charging points but i will take away a query about solar panels Thank you. Uh, quickly, Councillor Trish Smith, because we need to move on. Sorry, Chair. It was just the uh, the point about the on-street charges not being rapid charges, please. Thank you. Yep, sorry. Um, I mean, I can take that way as a query. My suspicion is around the electrical infrastructure being able to support a rapid and the associated costs. Uh, it costs roughly about forty, fifty thousand pounds to install a rapid charger. So I'm assuming it's um, something that's been cost prohibitive. But I can certainly take that away if you could give me the, the precise locations. I'll look into it. Just a very quickly. Sorry. Just a quick one. EV chargers, car parking spaces, why are the one and a half sizes compared to a normal car? So when you go to planning and, and they're asking for EV chargers, obviously it means reducing the parking spaces or planning has got to be changed. I just wondered why they're oversized because the vehicles are not oversized. Thank you. I do not know the answer to that question, but I will take it away. Thank you very much for that. So moving on to the next item there, which is item 13, antisocial behaviour team. Hi, thank you. Uh, so for those that weren't here at the beginning of the meeting, um, on, on YouTube, um, I'm Scott Lobbisco, I'm the lead, well, one of the leads on social behaviour team supervisors. Um, covering the west of Leeds. So just like everybody else, I've um, been asked to try and cover everything in, in 10 minutes, which is, is quite a short time. I could probably talk to you for hours about procedures and things of antisocial behaviour. So I will run over this very briefly, and then if there's any questions, queries at the end, um, hopefully I'll have time to answer those. So the first point, um, asked to just give a verbal report on is the inter internal process and procedure of LASBAT. So very quickly from start to finish, um, we will receive a complaint about social behaviour. Um, which could be a, a wide variety of, uh, of issues. Um, that will then go through to, from our contact centre to our triage team, which has um, only recently been set up and it's about two years old now. The triage team will correctly allocate that case, whether it to be ourselves um, or if it's, for example, a highways issue, they'll pass on to the highways team or the police, et cetera. 
That case will then go into um, our Q1 caseworks, which I'll come on to shortly, um, and will be allocated to a case officer, which I'll also come on to shortly. So each case is different. Um, of course, it depends what the priorities are and vulnerabilities are on a case. Um, but in gen generally speaking, um, general process of a case would be um, our case officer would interview the complainant and witnesses, um, do the vulnerability assessments with those, make any necessary referrals. It would then be the same process for an accused. Um, so we'd approach the accused, speak to the, um, put forward delegations and, and do vulnerability assessments um, with, with an accused party as well. It would then be um, a point of case building um, and evidence building. So we'd lay as we have our partners, our relevant agencies, collate any evidence, um, such as diaries, nuisance diaries. Um, and sorry, I should have said as well, I keep referring to LAS, but that stands for Leads on Social Behaviour Team. So we would collect diaries, um, nuisance, noise nuisance, di not sorry, not nuisance diaries, um, ASB and noise nuisance diaries, um, photograph statements, anything like that, that could you know, be used in, in evidence. Um, if, that, if that evidence obtained tips the balance of probability, then we can take necessary action. Um, and I mentioned balance probability because um, people may be more familiar with the police in that for the police, in order to get a conviction, charge or conviction, there has to be no reasonable doubt. Um, so it has to be absolutely proven, no doubt whatsoever. With the answer behavior team, because we're civil, it's it's slightly different in that if we can balance the probability, if we can tip the balance of probability that something has happened rather than not happened, we can then take necessary action on that. And if it does go as far as legal action, it will of course be up to a court at the end of the day on, on what, what is decided. So really quickly, and this is one of the points I could probably talk for hours on, um, is, is the actions we can look at. So we'd start, we can look at tenancy side of things, but that is of course only if they're lease city council tenants. We also deal with um, private residents as well. So we can look at tenancy warnings, which can then lead on to legal action, such as um, possessions or closures of a property. Um, other enforcements and things we can look at are um, access behaviour contracts, injunction warnings, but they, again, they can then lead on to legal actions such as um, injunctions. Communication with our partners will continue throughout the case being active. Um, so that, that's kind of a really quick overview on that point. I do have two more points to go through, but just to make it easier, I don't know if anybody's got any questions or queries they wanted to raise on, on that point. Anybody got any questions? Thank you. Thank you. So to move on to the next point, um, provide information on how caseworks is logged, um, on how casework is logged, sorry, and how officer resource is allocated to jobs within LASBAT. So the system we actually use is called caseworks, um, and that is where, we, we do have a number of systems, but that's where primarily our, our cases are kept and everything is logged on there. So once a case is open from our triage team, like I say, it will go into our queue. It's then up to myself and the other team supervisor to allocate those cases out to the relevant case officers. So, sorry, I'll just come on to that as well, a little bit more in detail in a second. So, in terms of what we keep in our cases, all involved parties, including um, your complainants, your witnesses, parents, guardians, accused, are all kept on a case. All their information is kept on our cases. All notes, vulnerability assessments, conversations we've had with partners, interview notes, any evidence we obtain are all kept on caseworks also, and such as enforcement actions as well. So if we serve a housing caution, that will be on, on there. And then if the case is closed and reopened within 12 months, it will be there for the next case off to see that that's, uh, of course, still in place. So um, key performance indicators um, are also managed through our casework system. And our key performance indicators... Um, are basically there to ensure that we're meeting, uh, we're, we're contacting customers in a, in a timely manner and keeping up to date with customers. Um, and, and finally, just from, from Caseworks, the letters we produce, any warnings, anything like that, invite letters are all generated through Caseworks. They are a little bit outdated, so they do take quite a bit of, of edit, editing, some of them, but everything we, we do in a nutshell is, is run through, through Caseworks. We do have 13 case officers in our team. We did have 14. Um, however, we've we've lost one to um, ELI earlier this year. So we have 13 case officers across the west of Leeds now. 
cases, particularly over this last, say, 18 months, probably just a little bit more than 18 months now, um, have, have as, as you probably imagine, gone through the roof with, with COVID. Um, and obviously, we've had some, some staffing issues and things. So, particularly over the, the last 18 months or so, um, there has been a, uh, there has been a lot of situations where cases, you know, less high, lower risk cases have have not been forgotten about, but kind of obviously dealt with um, not as quickly as there would have been usually. So of course we've got to prioritise our cases through risk risk urgency, which is which is what's done through the Thrive assessment by the triage team. So of the thirteen case officers we've got in um, in our team in West team. Um, they are divided up into the to the areas, um, into certain areas. So, uh, for example, Pudsey, um, we Pudsey and Whirler, we have two case officers manager in that area. We've got a brand new starter, um, one of the case officers that you you may know has just left. So they will be in contact with you shortly if they haven't been already. So we have two case officers, um, and the reason we have that is so we can we can have our case officers building those relationships, those connections in their area. Um, and so they know the area. Um, cases are usually allocated. So, for example, if we get a case in Pudsey, we'll usually be allocated to one of those two case officers. Of course, sometimes with capacity issues, um, it might not be possible, which is, is when it may be passed on to um, another, another case officer. Um, and just in terms of how we allocate um, our offer, officer resource, that's, that's a little, little bit there for you. But also, um, it's managed through risk and We'll do monthly supervisor reviews, one to ones to go through cases, um, make sure everything's being done that needs to be done, um, and any instructions obviously needs to be given from there. That one. So, again, that's that's just that point quickly covered. If there's any questions on that one, any questions, anybody? Councillor Anne Blackburn, Councillor Trish Smith. Yes, just to query. <clears throat> You said that there were two case officers. Did you say in Pudsey and Wortley or just for Pudsey itself? It's Pudsey Wortley. Yes, well, that's over two wards then, yeah. Sorry, yes, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick one. You said that currently the letters on your system are out of date um, and therefore it's costing you time every time you're going in would it not be more efficient to update the system um just once and then the letters are ready to to go or is that not practical um probably such a subject to be honest council at the moment um the system caseworks we've got is is not the best um and as we have we are there has been talks of it being replaced for a while and i think that is still currently in motion um updating the letters because of the way this it's all in, integrated into the system, it, it wouldn't be as simple as as um, as kind of just updating them through the system. We don't have those permissions. We would have to go to um, the provider caseworks themselves to do that. And sorry, just to be clear up, the maybe I over exaggerate when I say it's, it, it's not when, with the letters. They do require a little bit of editing anyway, because obviously they're personalised per case. Um, so, for example, if we're doing an outcome letter, we'll have to say the reasons why a case is being closed. Um, there are some things on there, just some wording that does need slightly changing, but it's wording that we have saved, so it's literally a case of copy and paste. So it's not the most practical in the world, but it's not something that does cost us a lot of time or any expense in, in that sense. I'm just concerned that you sort of time. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I may have over-exaggerated over that a little bit. Thank you. David Blackburn, then Councillor Seary. Yeah. Um, if you've got a case, if you close a case, um, uh, I'll still be careful what I'm saying here because it's not hypothetical. It, it deals actually deals with a proper case. But if you've closed a case uh, because um, the said person in the case is um, in secure accommodation outside of Leeds, uh, but may come back to live in the council house that they lived in if they came back to that house would you reopen that file or would you have to start again no we would reopen that case um so 
what we generally do, um, because that, the majority of actions we take on a case um, last 12 months for housing caution, for example. So if a case is closed, we can reopen a case um, 11 months later and that housing caution would still be in place. Siri. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a quick one, you know the triage process, how long would that take or should take? Because obviously I have experiences where it were a good couple of months before I put you know, a, a question in and before I got any information back. Um, to give you a detailed answer on that, I'm not the best person, but what I can say is, um, as I've said, particularly since COVID, um, I mean, well, since the chair seems coming in, it has, there has been a kind of a, a bit of a teething process as, as could be expected, um, particularly with, with COVID. Um, and most recently, the um, CAT system that's used now to raise inquiries, um, it's actually open to members of the public. So naturally, there has been um, a huge influx um, of inquiries going through to the triage team. So just to give an example, speaking to Kevin Brighton, who, um, who was the head of the triage team, um, I think they were dealing with around two and a half thousand inquiries um, at the peak time last month. They have got that down now, um, but generally, you should be hearing back, if it's a priority case, high risk case, you should be hearing back within one working day. Um, and I believe it's it's two working days for, for other cases. Because with many services, you get an email back to say that it's been logged, but I were waiting weeks and you can imagine what a residents are feeling because obviously that's why they've come to you for raising it. And I had to escalate it to, to try and get it even reported. Um, and that was one of my concerns. And there's just another one as well. It's obviously these are referrals that come back to yourselves, but we've got a massive issue with, with fireworks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do we report that individual ones as a council? Are we not responsible to take that forward and, and to tackle that? I believe council have got, you know, policies and, you know, they, they can stand and, and do what they need to do to, to tackle fireworks and, and the antisocial behavior that we're getting before bonfire night. Is that not something we can do? So yes, there has been there has been um, a number of, of kind of bully agency meetings and, and discussions around fireworks and around bonfire night. Um, particularly in, in this ward, um, I'm not exactly sure on what what means those those have taken place um, from kind of a more local point of view. Um, but I know it's particularly high on the police agenda. Um, what what makes it difficult with ourselves with, with fireworks? Of course, we do, we do. Um, we can we can take action on those, particularly if it's council tenant. What makes it difficult with fireworks and probably with, with anything really um, when it comes down to social behaviour is identifying those that are involved. If we have the the identities of those that are involved, we we can look at taking those actions. Um, but if we if we don't have those, it does make it a lot more difficult for us um, as the anti-social behaviour team. Okay, that's it. Yeah, Thank you. Can we note the the context of the report. Thank you very much for that report. So we're nearly there now. Nearly there, everybody. So the last one is the Environmental Protection Service. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, just an update on the Environmental Protection Team. So the Environmental Protection Team is part of the Environmental Health Service. Um, so the service has kind of three arms to it. So we've got the food safety team, then we've got um, pest control, and then environmental protection. So the environmental protection team, um, we deal with environmental nuisance, we deal with health and safety, local air pollution control, dog wardens, you name it, throw it in, it's all in there. Um, nuisance in the city is split between different teams. So the environmental protection team deal with commercial nuisance from commercial premises. Last back will deal with noise nuisance from domestic premises. Cleaner neighbourhoods team will deal with waste and waste issues from all premises. So it's not just it's not just as straight cut as one team deals with all. So it is split across um, those teams. So from the environmental protection team's perspective, we deal with commercial nuisance. So that can be commercial noise, dust, odour whatever it is really um, and basically the, re the request can come in to us a number of ways so direct by email to the EP team at least.gov.uk by telephone direct to our own business support colleagues residents can report online which has caused some issues when the forms were redone because there was no split between 
commercial and domestic. So last back, we're getting a lot of them. Hopefully now that's resolved, touch wood. Um, and it, they are being allocated to the right teams as of. So that's when residents go online. But we are also reliant on residents choosing the right category so that it goes to the correct team. Um, or it can go through the contact centre. So there's a number of ways that we get referrals. When we do get referrals, they're allocated to an officer. Um, prefer, or it may be, depending on whether it is, but if it's a first time, we'll probably send out a questionnaire and asking, is it a one-off? Is it an ongoing problem? Just to gather some further information. Um, if it's a returning one, it's allocated to an officer for further investigation. So following Councillor Siri, some queries from Councillor Siri a few weeks ago, I've now asked that when ward members are making referrals, that the email confirmation that goes back to ward members includes the job reference number and the officer that it's been allocated to. So that's that should now be in place. I've asked business support colleagues to do that. Um, so yeah, it's um, what action can we take? Well, we approach each job where we'll approach both sides um, just to get a picture of what's going on. Um, we're there to support business as well as investigate. So it is a fine line. Um, but if we do determine that, th that noise or nuisance is a statutory nuisance, then we will serve a formal notice. Once that notice is served, should there be any breach to that notice, then that's when it becomes a criminal offence. And should there be a breach of the notice, then it would then go and we would look at prosecuting the business. We also have to bear in mind there are other areas. So we also work uh, within licensing legislation and we also work with colleagues in planning enforcement. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you very much. So now on to um, date and time of the next meeting. We've got a meeting planned in February, Mike. Yes, Wednesday the 16th of February. Okay, that's that's good. Um, can I suggest that we have a meeting in January, even if it's just by Zoom to get through some business? Um, and we have to confirm whatever we do at the next meeting. I don't mind if, because we can't make decisions in the Zoom meeting. We've got to uh, have a meeting face to face to make decisions. But I think we're going to have so much business to get through. I don't want another meeting like this because it's been very long today. Is that possible? Is everybody happy with that? Chair, that would be only a consultative meeting, so it wouldn't be minuted unless you actually requested that. I think that would be fine. I just think we need to get on with some business, that's all. Yeah, okay. Everybody happy with that? Great. Can we put that in the diary then, Mike? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other business? That's a relief. It's been a long one, hasn't it? Have you got any more at your face? Have you got any more business, Mike? You have, haven't you? Uh, no, nothing for me. There was the suggestion of the Jubilee discussion from um, Councillor yeah, Andrew Carson. Uh, Jubilee. Yeah. Councillor Carter was going to to bring that up, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, or can we defer that to the next meeting then, the consultative one? Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention and thank you for everybody who's watching. Thanks.